Hello, this is Bethany Leone, editor of Heat Treat Radio, stepping in with a quick word about this episode, which is available in full video. Watch and listen to the full length of the episode at heatreattoday.com forward slash radio and look for Lunch and Learn with Heat Treat Today. Support for today's Heat Treat Radio episode is provided by Heat Treat Today's 40 Under 40 Class of 2022. Learn more about this award at www.heatreattoday.com forward slash 40 under 40 promo. And welcome to Heat Treat Radio. We have another Lunch and Learn with members of the Heat Treat Today team joined by the Heat Treat doctor, Dan Herring. Dan will be talking about what mill processes and products look like as it relates to aluminum and steel. This is part one to the conversation where we'll lay the groundwork of what materials are involved in aluminum and steel making. In part two, Dan will talk about the heat treatment and the actual products that come out of these processes. Heat Treat Today team members include Alyssa Bootsma, the social media editor, Doug Glenn, publisher, Evelyn Thompson, assisting editor, Karen Ganser, managing editor, and myself. Let's take a listen. Thanks, Doug, and good afternoon, and hello, everybody, again. Uh, It's my pleasure to be here, and uh, what I'm going to attempt to do in about the next 30 to 40 minutes is take about three or 4,000 pages of literature and condense it down into uh, 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 some simple English and some common sense, if you will. So we will talk about mill practices, production methods, and what I like to call the forms produced. And we'll we'll talk about that a little bit. And uh, we might call this whole thing simplified for lack of a better uh, better terminology, if that makes sense. Uh, and the focus today will be, I, I've selected two materials, two very common materials to talk about. Uh, the first one is aluminum. And the second is, uh, is steel. Uh, but I'm going to disguise that a little bit and talk about a little about aluminum and iron. Um, just to recall uh, maybe our high school chemistry, aluminum or aluminium, as it's called by the rest of the world, has chemical symbol AL and iron has chemical symbol FE. Now, you might wonder how we got FE from iron. Uh, it's from the Latin word ferrium which is F-E-R-R-I-U-M. So that's where the F-E has come from. Uh, Aluminium is another story, which I'll leave for another time, but it's quite interesting. But if we're gonna talk about aluminum and if we're gonna talk about iron, um, why why isn't steel an element? That's a question I get very often. Uh, Steel is actually an alloy that's a combination of different elements. And the way I like to think about steel is it's iron and manganese and carbon and some other alloying elements put in that make specific types of steel that are used for specific applications and application purposes. And and we'll talk a little about that. Now, the other common question I get, and you guys might be interested in this, is you've heard of uh, terms in history like the Stone Age, where where all the the tools, and by the way, the weapons were made of of stone. And similarly, the, the Stone Age gave way to something called the Bronze Age. You may have heard of that as well. And that's where an alloy of copper and tin came on. Again, it made better tools, and by the way, better weapons than the Stone Stone Age did or the stone tools were. Um, And then later, you've probably heard that there was something called an Iron Age. And we, we all commonly have heard these terms, but why haven't we heard about the Steel Age? You might be, you know, that's a common question. I mean, what is the steel age? Why isn't it an age, if you will? And that's because we came up with a very fancy term. We called it the industrial revolution, where we started to use steel as an engineering material. 
But I, again, don't want to get too off subject here, but thought I'd mention that. So we begin with raw material. And we call that in the industry, uh, we call that an ore. Now, most roast raw material is in the form of ore or minerals that are found in nature. And they're typically the element of interest, aluminum or iron in this case, combined with possibly some undesirable elements. So the ore that we, we uh, get from, the raw material that we get from the earth has to be refined to make it into a metal. And uh, there are certain raw materials, and gold is a good example, which is, which is found in its pure state. I wish I could have found more of it in my career. I wouldn't be talking to you, but no, that's a different story. But the idea here is the fact that most ores come in the form of, or most minerals are found in nature and have to be refined. Um, the principal ore containing aluminum is something we call bauxite. And bauxite is aluminum oxide, chemical symbol Al2O3. Uh, the way I like to think of bauxite is bauxite is dirt. We can we can we can put a we can put a dress on it, but it's still dirt at the end of the day. It's a special type of dirt. It's it's a dirt that has forty to sixty percent aluminum oxide in it. And there are certain areas in the world where bauxite is more common than others. Uh, interestingly enough, Australia is a tremendous source of bauxite, as is Africa. So that's why you find the majority of bauxite mines or uh, in either Australia or Africa or other places in the world. Now, when you get into iron, uh, there's two principal ores, they're hematite and magnetite. They are iron oxides and they're obviously rich in iron. But, but to begin, let's, let's deal with aluminum and, and what the mill has to do uh, or what the aluminum manufacturing process really is. We start off, as I said, uh, with dirt, uh, with the raw ore. Uh, we then uh, get fancy and we crush it into a very coarse powder. And then after we've crushed it, we want to refine it. We wanna take and remove some of the impurities. So we mix it with a little, what we call caustic soda, which is sodium hydroxide and lime, which is calcium oxide or calcium carbonate. And we use that refining method to purify the raw ore. And what we wind up with, interestingly enough, is a very fine white powder, which is called alumina or aluminum oxide. So we start out the manufacturing process with a raw material that is a very, very fine powder that is almost all, it's principally 99% aluminum oxide. And we take it and we put it into a, a furnace, we heat it. So we, we do that process with electricity because we're using carbon anodes, if you will, placed into the, into the bath that we pass current through to melt the aluminum. And the process therefore is extremely energy uh, intensive. Yeah. That's why you find aluminum production plants uh, in areas like the Tennessee Valley, where we have a lot of hydroelectric power. You find them in Iceland, where you have a lot of ge geothermal energy to, to help produce electricity, if you will. But they're very electric, uh, uh, electrically um, uh, intensive operations. Now, the, the scientific reason for that is that the chemical bond between aluminum and oxygen is very strong. And as a result of that, we need a lot of energy to break that bond apart, 
to produce aluminum, the metal, and oxygen, the byproduct, if you will. So a lot of energy is required for that. Uh, you might also find it interesting that when the process was first developed back in the 1880s, and it took that long, by the way, to produce pure aluminum, if I remember right, the year was 1883, but the price of an ounce of aluminum was more expensive than the price of an ounce of gold, just because of the manufacturing method. But anyway, we've taken this alumina powder We've, which is a white powder, we've melted it into a silvery colored metal. And we do that inside a furnace and then we tap the furnace. In other words, we pour out the molten aluminum and we either produce cast products from the aluminum or we produce what are called ingots for subsequent working. So we either make castings directly or we make ingots. Uh, cast products, examples of them, Doug, might be, or everybody, I shouldn't just say Doug, yeah. might be uh, engine blocks, um, uh, wheel rims for automobiles, um, uh, even some small appliances. Uh, there are uh, castings, uh, toasters are cast, typically, uh, patio furniture, tools, cookware, uh, a lot of things wind up just as cast products. But if we've produced an ingot, now we have various methods that we take to produce a engineered product, if you will. We can extrude the aluminum. In other words, we can take an aluminum ingot and we can put it in a press and press it into a form. And we can make things like aluminum ladders, bicycle frames, uh, even certain airframe components out of extruded material. We can take these ingots and we can roll them. We can roll them hot or we can roll them cold. Interestingly enough, it's called hot rolling and cold rolling. Metallurgists are pretty creative that way. But we can turn around and when we roll it, we can make, we can make sheet, we can make plate, we can make, make something that we're all very familiar with, which is aluminum foil. Uh, we can make wire. Uh, we can, we, as I said, sheet, plate, wire. We can make uh, heat exchangers, uh, panels for automobiles. Uh, we can make battery components. We can make, um, again, in the transportation industry, a lot of things for either automobiles or airframes. And similarly, we can also forge the material. And we hot forge it in this particular case, but we can make uh, various rings and blocks and cylinders and sleeves and components that we can then take and machine. So the, the process of, of manufacturing aluminum is relatively straightforward. And it winds up, as I said, with a ingot of some type that is then manufactured into a product. Any questions about that? Have I covered it too quickly or have I kind of summarized it for everybody? I think it's good. I think it's good. And if anybody's got a question, I want to jump in with two, two thoughts. One, you were talking about the, uh, uh, that the manufacturing of aluminum from raw materials is highly energy intense. Uh, two points on that. One, it's much more energy intense than steel production for one thing. And secondly, that makes some sense of why it is we do so much recycling, or at least try to recycle aluminum, because it's a lot cheaper to take already, already formed aluminum, an aluminum can, or an aluminum wheel off a car, and melt it down. The amount of energy to do that is a lot less than it is to create it from, create uh, uh, aluminum from scratch. So that, that was one thing, Dan, maybe if you want to comment on that. And then the second thing you were talking about extruding, uh, I imagine most everybody on this call knows what that is. You were talking about pressing it into a form. And remember with an extrusion, it's a, you're pressing it through a die. So you're pressing, it's kind of like your Play-Doh, you know, that you push in that, push in that form and you get the star coming out the other end. That's extrusion not, and not to be confused with forging where you're putting it into a kind of a closed 
thing and you're pressing it into a form. So just two, two thoughts there. Yeah, that, that's, those are both very, very good, uh, good comments. Uh, interestingly enough, uh, when you get into iron and steel making, uh, the uh, minerals, the iron oxides, if you will, uh, are far easier to break the bond between iron and oxygen than it is between aluminum and oxygen. Oh, uh, interesting. That's why the, the aluminum is such a energy intensive process. And absolutely correct, recycling produces or saves a tremendous amount of cost um, and is something that is vital to the um, long-term success of aluminum because an aluminum product in general is more expensive than a steel product. Yeah. And you are correct when you do extrusion, and I'll explain that a little bit more, but when you extrude something, you, you basically squeeze it through a die, if you will. And we'll talk a little bit about that in forging. When we return, Dan will return our attention to how iron and steel are manufactured. But first, Heat Treat Today's annual 40 Under 40 Award goes to young folks in North America's heat treat industry who are giving their time, talent, and education to make the industry a better place. Who are these rising young leaders? Likely your own clients and colleagues. A nomination takes just five minutes, so go to heattreetoday.com forward slash four zero under four zero promo now. Winners receive year-long recognition on www.heattreetoday.com and are featured in the September trade show magazine. We need your help to locate hidden heat treaters who discreetly work away from the public eye, especially those who are operating at captive heat treat facilities. Who do you think are, is a rising young leader in the North American heat treat industry? Well, type heattreattoday.com forward slash four zero under four zero promo to nominate the first person that you think of right now. Once more, that's heattreattoday.com forward slash four zero under four zero promo. Now back to the episode. But I want everyone on the call and everyone listening to this to, to understand that when we start to talk about iron and steel making, because the process has been around for such a long time, there are certain terms that are used in the manufacturing process that have become just synonymous with the process itself. So once again, we start out with a iron oxide, uh, a mineral in the form of, of as I said, uh, um, magnetite or hematite, uh, we take that raw ore and we put it into something called a blast furnace. And this is where we take and we do a process called smelting of the material. We form a, a metal uh, by taking and reducing the ore in the presence of air under pressure. So coming out of the blast furnace, is molten metal, molten, uh, molten iron, if you will. Now, historically, it's called pig iron. And the reason for that is when they originally cast different shapes or you know, cast molds with shapes, the resulting structure looked like uh, a litter of piglets that were actually suckling on their mother. So the term pig iron came about uh, as these little pigs, if you will, were, were broken off uh, uh, from, the main, from the main casting. Uh, so as I said, there's a lot of historical things going on. But uh, in, the, in the old days, you then took the pig iron and you put it into what is called either a BOF furnace, a basic oxygen furnace, or an EAF furnace called an electric arc furnace. But today, and then you remelted the, the pigs, if you will. But today, most of the BOF and EAF processes, you wind up charging a hot liquid iron into those furnaces. Um, they, they heat it up or continue to heat it up and then you turn around after you've, you've converted the, the pig iron, 
which is about 94% iron and 6% impurity. So it's still, it, it's, it's still very impure. And with processing in a BOF or EAF furnace, you get the impurity levels down to less than 1%. Okay. And you might say to yourself, well, why is that important? Well, the idea in steel making is to take the raw material, the iron, and take everything out of it so we can precisely add back in just those chemical elements that we want to make a particular type of steel. So that's essentially what the BOF, basic oxygen furnace or electric arc furnace is doing. It's converting the molten metal or the pig iron uh, into a very, very pure material. We then do a process which is called tapping. We trans uh, transfer the raw material into what we call a ladle furnace. I know this gets a little complicated, but bear with me. And inside the ladle is where we do the, the remainder of the refining process. What we wind up doing is we purify um, the material. We, we get rid of the additional impurities that are present, um, uh, anything from hydrogen and oxygen and excess nitrogen to, uh, to tramp elements and things of this nature. So in the ladle, we do the refining. And this can be done uh, in a vacuum process, a vacuum degassing process. It can be done with an argon, uh, argon uh, process, if you will. Uh, but we go from the blast furnace to the refining furnace, the BOF or the EAF. We then go into the ladle. And what we're doing is we're taking the raw material and we're making a pure and pure and pure form of, first of all, iron. And then we're starting to add in elements that we want to make steel to make a particular grade of steel or type of steel. And then we're going to do a process called teeming and casting. And teeming is T-E-E-M-I-N-G, as I recall, which is basically pouring the molten metal into molds. So again, what we wind up with is we have a process where we have liquid steel. And now we're going to send it into either something called a continuous caster. We're going to make ingots out of it. Or we're going to take and atomize the steel. And I want to talk about atomizing the liquid steel first. The process is done by adding a gas such as nitrogen or argon or even air or by using water. But the idea here is that what you wind up with is a powder metal. By the way, it's not, it's called powder metallurgy, not powdered metallurgy. Yeah. Powdered is cookies, okay? <laughs> but powder is what we produce from the atomizing process. Uh, the powder can be Either in either can be cylindrical, I'm sorry, spherical in nature, or it can be rounded or even irregular shaped, depending on the type of atomization process. But we take this liquid stream of metal and we impinge it with either water or gas and burst it or break it apart into particles. And then we do a simple process, which is called screening of those particles. Mm -hmm. it's, it's basically taking and, and getting finer and finer or dividing the powder into finer and finer powders, if you will. And depending on the purification of the powder, how fine the powder is, we use it for what we call conventional powder metallurgy. So we take and use it for basic sintering operations, for example. Uh, you're all familiar with the rear view mirror on your automobile. Hmm. Interestingly enough, the rear view mirror fits into something called a mirror mount. And that mirror mount is a powder metal part. 
happens to be a stainless steel, but it's a powder metal part. Um, but the idea is the fact that we can have a conventional powder metal. We can have, if we use finer powder, we can have a metal that's suitable for metal injection molding, for making things like firearm components, uh, orthodontic braces and things of this nature or other medical type devices. Or if we get a super fine powder, we can turn around and we can use it for something called additive manufacturing. So we'll talk a little bit more about these later, but from the casting process, we can either go into a continuous caster, we can make ingots, or we can atomize the, the liquid steel. If we go into a continuous caster, we're, we're cooling down the steel and we're producing three products. They're called blooms, billets, and bars. I don't expect you to memorize all this, but they're basically, the difference between them is their physical shape. Uh, a billet might only be 10 inches square or something of this size. Okay. 10 by 10 by 10. Uh, a bloom is, is defined as something that's less than 100 square inches, typically, uh, except if it's a jumbo bloom caster, which makes bigger blooms. But we'll ignore that. It gets complicated quickly. But the idea here is the fact that we're either going to take the liquid steel, we're going to cool it down in some continuous fashion, or we're going to put it into a mold to make an ingot or we're gonna atomize it using water or a gas to make a powder. So those are the three forms that come out of this whole process. I got, now, I, Dan, I got a quick question for you on that, if you don't mind. The, in, with the aluminum, you mentioned that you can melt it and then cast it directly into like a finished product, like a, a, you call it a cast product. Do we do that much with steel? Do we often take steel and actually take it directly into a, an alternator casing or some other finished part? Yeah, absolutely. There's a lot of cast oh. steel that's used. The example that comes quickly to mind are probably valve bodies okay. that are used in the petrochemical industry and things. Um, if you think about on the iron side, you're very familiar with uh, cast iron skillets and things, cast iron cookware. I think everybody's aware or uh, aware of that. You can also have steel castings as cookware, but you typically don't. It's more expensive. But yes, you can make a variety of products directly uh, as a casting. Uh, you can, as I said, make powder metallurgy products. And you can also make a family of products that we then call wrought products. And what we do is we take those billets, blooms, and bars, and then we either hot work them or cold work them to make various types of materials. Uh, we can roll them, we can pierce them, we can forge them. Uh, we can make, again, we can make sheet, we can make plate, we can make bar and tubular products, we can make wire, we can make strip. Uh, a good example is the fact that if you're a razor blade manufacturer, you want to order material from the mill that's in the form of strip, thin, thin strip, actually. If, on the other hand, um, you're, you're taking and you're in the oil and gas industry, and if you're ordering pipe or tubing uh, for you know use, as we call it, down hole, uh, obviously, it does no good to have delivered a, a strip of steel or a sheet of steel or a plate of steel. You want something, uh, obviously, in the form of a tube or a pipe that can then be used. We hope you enjoy listening to today's episode with Dan Herring. Heat Treat Radio is on Apple Podcasts, SoundCloud, iHeartRadio, Podbean, and the website www.heattreattoday.com forward slash radio. If you'd like to get in contact with Dan, head over to www.heat-treat-doctor.com or you can email him at dherring at 
heattreatdoctor.com and those are hyphens between heat treat doctor or you can email me and i can put you in touch my email is bethany at heattreattoday.com you can also reach out to me if you have a new or interesting idea that you want to hear promoted or if you'd like to sponsor a future episode again my email is bethany at heattreattoday.com Heat Treat Radio is just one of the ways that Heat Treat Today tries to help you get the information you need to make good decisions. If you like what you heard, explore the e-newsletters, e-books, social media groups, and more on heattreattoday.com. Also, be on the lookout when we release part two of this episode with Dan Herring on milling. Heat Treat Radio would like to thank the Heat Treat Today 40 Under 40 Class of 2022 for sponsoring this episode. Nominate a rising young leader for the award at www.heatreetoday.com forward slash four zero under four zero promo. This and every other episode of Heat Treat Radio is the sole property of Heat Treat Today and may not be reproduced in part or in whole without advanced written permission from Heat Treat Today. And I'm Bethany Leone. Thank you for listening. <laughs>